not sit down after a song like that and just be like, oh, relax. No, no, no. Has anybody in here, can you say God has changed your life? Yeah. Oh, come on. you got to get a little more excited than that. If that song is really true in your heart, you say that is the greatest day in the history of your life, we should be a little more excited than just, woo. So one more time. Has God changed anybody's life in here? That's what I'm talking about. Has your story been rewritten by his story? Are you ready to take that story and do something with it? Come on. Right now, I want you to look at the person next to you, and I want you to tell them, I am ready for what God has for me. All right, you can go ahead and be seated. Happy Memorial Day weekend. It is so good to have you here with us today. Our pastors are on vacation. We wish them well. Come on, they're having a little uh, R&R time with their family. We all need that. So just continue to keep Pastor David and Pastor Chantel in prayer, as I know they're driving home tomorrow, and we just want them, well, just back and well-rested. Amen? Amen? Amen. We are we are finishing up our series on the story, how his story has changed my story. And it has been a great series. And I really want you to think just a little bit throughout this message, how has God changed your story? What has God done in your life where if you think if God did not come in, if I did not meet Christ, where would I be today? What would happen if I never allowed God, if I never positioned myself with Christ, where would I be right now? I often look back at the story of my life and I think about how I've ended up even right here at Cornerstone. And it's, quite, it's kind of a unique story for me. Because I remember back at the church that I was at before that I was on staff at, and I had these dreams of what God was going to do in my life. I was like, for sure, God, this is where I'm going. I figured when I was done at that church and there were some things happening and just some situations, I saw the incoming and I'm like, I'm going to go to another church. I'm going to be on paid staff. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It didn't turn out that way, by the way. Not at all. Did not go the way I, my dreams and my visions were kind of thinking they were going to happen. And it's kind of a unique story because I remember at that time, I was at that point and I had nothing lined up. And God's like, you're done here. You need to step down from your position. You need to move on. You need to let the next set of leadership come in and do what they need to do. And I'm like, all right, God, I'll do it. But where am I going? Don't worry about that. Just do what I'm asking you. I'm like, all right. So I literally left my job. I, I talked to my pastor. I informed him what God was speaking in my heart. We set a date and we did it. And I stepped out. I'm like, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm now out of a job. I'm now out of a ministry. I have nothing. And it was unique because then some things happened where my parents, my mom's parents got sick and they ended up needing full-time care. And Well, I was available. And I got to do one of the coolest things in my life. I got to take care of my grandparents in the final days of their life. And I'm telling you, it really is. It was difficult. It was emotional. It was hard. But it was during that season that I can honestly say that my grandfather became a, one of my best friends. Because I got to walk with my grandfather through one of the most difficult seasons of his life when he had to bury his wife. Amazing time. But it was during that time that I heard about a friend of mine, a, an old colleague of mine, who decided he was going to start a church. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to go up and I'm going to support this friend of mine. I'm just going to say, hey, you know, I got your back. You know, whatever, you know, you're doing a great job. So I found out where he was meeting and found out it was in his home. And I came up to old Pastor David and Chantel's home up off of Moore and LaToya. And I said, hey, you know, just wanted to support you guys. And that's all I thought it was going to be. Who knew that uh, almost five years later I'd still be by his side cheering him on going, you're going to do a great job. You're going to do a great job. Am I on staff at a church? Well, kind of. I am on the leadership team. And my full-time paid staff? Absolutely not. And so when I felt God saying, Jeremy, this is the church. You need to support Pastor David. You need to be on his team. You need to just go. I'm like, okay, God, what am I going to do for money? <laughs> got to pay the bill somehow. And so I started talking, just praying and going, okay, well, I got this little skill, graphic design skill. Let's see if I can, like, get some business going. So I tried to start my business, which was an epic failure. But it was through trying to get that going that... I started to connect with Andrew Ford, and Andrew put me in connection with a networking group. And I started trying to get involved with this networking group, trying to get business coming, which absolutely nothing came through. But the leader of that group said, 
I missed a meeting. I remember this discussion. He said, Jeremy, you missed. What's going on? And I'm like, well, I've been seeing this girl. I kind of want to get married, but if I'm going to get married to her, I've got to have more of a steady income. So I'm looking for another job. I think I'm going to quit my business and just try to get into a secular work field and kind of do this. He's like, well, I know somebody. And I think they're looking for a designer. Let me make a call. I'll call you back. And so I get a call back a little while later from this gentleman by the name of Eric. And he said, Jeremy, I want you to call a gentleman by the name of Jason Green. He works at a company called Vision 7 Software. They're looking for a designer. I'm like, okay. So I call him and I said, you know, hey, I'm a designer. I kind of own my own business and kind of told him what I did. He's like, well, send in your resume and send in a portfolio and we'll meet with you and we'll go over it. Well, I did that and they hired me. Why to this day? I still cannot tell you why they hired me. Because this was a web design company and a software design company, and I had zero experience in web design and software design. I had none. But they took a chance on me. And I'm still at, sort of with this company, because what happened is, about six months after Katie and I got married, the company I was working for was kind of bought out by another company here in town. And this company by the name of Simply Bits said, hey, we want to start a department like yours. Why don't you guys just all come on staff with us? We'll bring you all on. And it kind of worked out for all of us. And here I am. I'm at this amazing company where three years ago, I'm sitting there going, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got this great church that I want to be a part of, but I need income. I want to do this, but I've got, I've got to afford a house. I've got to afford to take care of a family. And it's amazing how through a situation, what I thought my life was going to be like really isn't like. But I can tell you this, I'd have it no other way. I'd have it no other way. And it is amazing as I look through scripture how a lot of people kind of fit that bill. One of the people I think a lot about is a man by the name of Joseph. Who as a kid had a dream. Had dreams. He was a dreamer. He had huge dreams. And Joseph was like, told his dad, he told his brothers, he told his family, listen, i got to tell you my dream. I've got a dream I want to tell you about. God said this is going to happen. And of course... You know, his dad's just like, keep that quiet. Don't go telling people. His brothers didn't like it. Why? Because he basically told them that his dream was that his family was going to be bowing down before him and he was going to be a place of authority over them. And it's crazy when you look at Joseph. We know it was a God-given dream. We know it was something. And, you know, I kind of, this is such an interesting time to be speaking this message because I was just at some graduation parties yesterday. I remember graduation. I was thinking about it last night as I was finishing up my message. I was like, man, I remember graduation. All excited about college and possibly moving out on my own. And, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start, you know, this is now school for me. And I'm going to do this. But then I also remembered how nervous I was, how much fear was there going, oh, man, this is big. Come on, you guys remember. But at the same time, you're dreaming, but you're so nervous and you're kind of fearful all at the same time. You understand what I'm saying? When you're at that moment, that threshing floor of you've got a dream and now it's like something's going to be put into action. There's a little bit of excitement. There's a little bit of let's go for it. But then there's a little bit of like, oh, are we sure we're doing this? And I feel like there's a part of Joseph that must have been like that as he dreamed. And he's like, God, this is one of the coolest things ever. And he's telling people, but I wonder if there's a side of him going, how is this ever going to happen? And so this dreamer ends up. Go, taking a path that he probably never thought he would walk. Because I don't know about you, if I was writing this story, if I was in Joseph's position, I would not have gone through what he went through. A lot of us probably would say, hey, you know, let's just take you, if this is what God wants, let's just put you in the palace right now. That way you can get training, you can get all the understanding you need, you can be trained by the best minds, we'll educate you so that when that time comes, you're ready, you've got it all in store. But that wasn't Joseph's path. God had a different story. And God took Joseph from a point of dreaming and put him in a pit, put him into slavery, put him in a prison long before he ever got to a palace. That's not the story I would want, I'm telling you now. <laughs> it's not the way I would have written it. But God's story, when God begins to write our story, it's amazing how things can change, and how we have influence. I want to tell you right now, the moment, wherever you are in your life, if you understand why you're going through the season you're in, or if you don't, you are there for purpose. Your position in life right now, you are positioned to influence people around you. 
You are positioned not there by mistake. You are not positioned there by chance. But I believe that you are there because God wants to use you to do something. And it amazes me that every step of the way through Joseph's life, he was having influence over people. He had influence over his brothers. They didn't like it, so they threw him in a pit. And we're going to pick up the story in Genesis chapter 39. Verse 1, it says this. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. I want to stop there for a second. This is pretty impressive. I want you to think about this. So bro Joseph's brothers got mad. They threw him in a pit. And they're like, what are we going to do with them? They wanted to kill him. One of them talked him out of it. So they said, all right, we'll sell him. And he was sold to these people called the Ishmaelites. And they were on their way to Egypt. Now, I want you to think about the divine moment that's taking place here. You talk about someone writing a story. This has to happen because these Ishmaelites had to have started traveling, I think it's at least two weeks in advance, to get to that point at the right time so that Joseph could be sold to them so that he could be taken to Egypt. Think about the timing of this story. Somewhere along the line, something had to happen in these people in a far distant country that had nothing to do with Joseph at the time to get them to the spot where his brothers were so that they could pay him, then they could take Joseph to Egypt so that Joseph could be in the place to be in power one day to save his family. You talk about writing a story. Would Joseph have done it that way? No, but God said, listen, there's more at play than just you. There's more than play than just you and I. And it goes on to say this, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes. This little Jewish boy from a distant country who was sold into slavery by his brothers found favor in the midst of the most horrible situation. Oh, I know a lot of times we sit there and think, oh, that wouldn't be so bad. He found favor. He started to find success. Yes, but he was away from his dad. He was away from his family. He's away from his brothers. He was pulled away from everything that he knew. And he, yes, he began to found favor, but I can guarantee you there's probably moments Joseph's going, God, what is going on? You gave me dreams of being in the palace. Now I'm far away from my family. I'm distant. I'm, I'm sitting here. But he had to have an attitude. There had to be something that gripped Joseph that began to say, you know what? I will make the most of this moment. I will make the most. And he began to serve with dignity. That's the best way to put it. He began to serve as if he was serving Christ, and he found favor in the eyes of his master and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. You see, a lot of us, if we were put in this situation, I don't know if we would have had the same work ethic. When in a moment you're sitting there thinking your position is not what you deserved, your position in life, the season you're in, you're at God, I should not even be in this, we decide to have a negative attitude. And yet I believe all the time God's sitting there going, no, you're here for purpose. You're here to influence. You're walking through the season of your life because I've got something greater for you. I'm writing your story right now and you don't even know it. God is working. And he goes on to say this. Listen, in verse 6, so Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except what he ate. That is a pretty big responsibility. And so Joseph begins to grow, and he begins to go through the season of, wow, you're being, I'm being entrusted. I've got everything. And he begins to kind of probably live the high life. Yes, he was still a slave, but he was a slave that was entrusted with a lot of stuff, so I'm sure with that came a lot of reward. We've got to understand that our position in life is not an accident. Joseph was positioned there to have an influence on Potiphar. He was positioned there to have an influence on his family. He was positioned there for a reason. We've got to understand that God will always position people he uses. Don't believe me? Let's start looking through the Bible. Moses. What a horrible, tragic event Moses went through. Didn't, probably didn't even remember it for the most part until people started telling him the story of his birth. And how at that time, throughout the Egyptian land, the Pharaoh decided he wanted to wipe out all the firstborn children, all the firstborn male of the 
Israelites because they were going to, going to be too powerful. So what did he do? He sent people and he started slaughtering little boys. But Moses' mom said, I can't have that, so I will give up my son. Put, put him in a basket. Sends him down a river at chance, hoping that someone would find him. So happened, the one that found him was Pharaoh's daughter. Moses is now taken, raised as a Pharaoh's son, raised in his household. This is the guy that is going to be determined to set Israel free, to lead them out of captivity. And it seems like that would be the ideal place for Moses to be standing in the palace next to Pharaoh. Say, Pharaoh, you, got, you can't be like this. You can't treat these people like this. He had his ear. He had the ability to do that. But no, God's writing the story. So what happens? Moses ends up in the back fields of a desert. We got some music going on here. <laughs> And he ends up in the backfield of a desert, far from the palace, far from where Pharaoh is, far from where you think his story should be taking place. But it's in that back part of the desert that he has an encounter with God. It's in the back part of the desert where he gets to know God, where he begins to build a relationship with God, where all of a sudden Moses is stripped down, the, the Egyptian mentality is stripped out, and the God mentality is put in. And then when he's ready, God says, okay, now it's time to go back. But if we, would, if we were writing the story, we probably would have never pulled Moses out. We would have left him there. If we were writing the story, we probably wouldn't have had Israel wander through the desert for 40 years. We probably would have just had him go straight to the promised land. What about Esther? What a crazy story once again. Here they are. They're captives. They've been taken away from their home. They're living in another land. They're slaves. They're, they're being kept from what they should be doing in life, what they thought they should be living. Esther is then taken away from her family because she's so beautiful. And, there's, and the king's like, I want, I'm looking for a new wife. Go find me all the beautiful women in the land and bring them here. And she's taken away from her family. But she makes a statement that is so powerful. And actually, I think it's Mordecai, her uncle, who says it. But in Esther 4, it says this in verse 14. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but what you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Can it be that what you are walking through in your life right now, God is saying you are here for such a time as this. That Cornerstone, yes, you are not in a building yet. Cornerstone, yes, you are not where you thought you would be, but you are here for such a time as this. Cornerstone, we are still here because God is still using us to do things and he's still using us to influence people. Guys, God is bigger than our position in life. God is bigger than your season. He's writing a story that is so fantastic. We can't see the end. We may not understand. But even though our position and your position may seem very insignificant, the God behind your position is not. I want you to get this today. The, the God who's writing your story, the God who's preparing you, the God who's positioning you to have an impact on people is not insignificant, even though you think your role in it may be. Because you see, the power in our position does not come from who we are, but from our position in Christ. One of my favorite scriptures is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says this. We've got to find out who we are. Can we just take a moment and find out where our position is? And I love this scripture. It says this. But you, say, but I am a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. I don't know about you, but reading this scripture kind of makes me kind of pull my shoulders back kind of walk a little bit, you know, kind of get some pride in me. You are God's special possession. You need to get this today. Tell yourself right now, everybody say, I am God's special possession. I am God's special possession. Say it again. I am God's special possession. And then it says, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, when I was reading this last night, I'm like, I'm going to... Go on over. This is the NIV version. I'm going to check out what the message says because sometimes the message puts it in a little different light. We're going to read it one more time, but in the message. You got it? 
All right, here we go. But you, now say, but I, but I am a chosen by, God, chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy person. I am God's instrument to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made in me. Come on, guys. What is the final line? From nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Is that not, come on, is that not the story that we've been talking about that God's been doing in our life? That God has taken me from nothing to something in life. That I was once rejected, but now I've been accepted by God. And what am I to do with it? God tells it. He says right here, I am God's instrument. My position, my life, my current circumstances are to do his work and speak out for him. To tell people about what God has done in my life. To tell people about the story that God's writing in my life. Is it complete? No. Not by a long shot. And neither is yours. Stop letting your past hold you back from telling people about what God is doing. I know there is a, an, ideal, an idealistic thought in America about hypocrisy in the Christian church. Well, guess what? There is. And we're all a part of it. Why? Because I don't 100% always make the mark I fail. And people will look at it and say, well, you're just a hypocrite. Yes, but the difference is I'm willing to pick up, apologize, make amends, and say, God, what do I need to do different? Because I know you're not done with my story. I know there's something greater that you have in line for me. Because my position in life is empowered by the position that I have in Christ. Oh, that one, come on. If that one's getting you shouting, wait till we get to this next one. Romans chapter 8, verse 15 says this. This resurrection life you received, in other words, your position that you received in Christ from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a child like, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirit and confirms who we really are. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. My position in life is all determined on who my daddy is. And my daddy is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is my God. He is the one true God. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us. An unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we will certainly go through the good times with him. Listen, your story, your situation, you may be sitting there going, God, I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. I hate this moment in my life. I am here to tell you that right now I believe God is beginning to say, listen, just listen to what I'm doing. Be obedient to what I've called you to do because you are here for purpose. If we would have written Christ's story, we would not have had him born in a manger. We would not have had him be raised as the son of a carpenter. And we probably would have never had him die. But God's story was a little different. And if he had to go through a little different story, then we should too. Because at the end of his story came resurrection. At the end of his story came some victory. And if that's the end of his story, then I want to start seeing what's at the end of my story. Church, today you need to allow God to write your story. Allow God to write your story. If you've been resisting what God's trying to speak into your life, if you've been resisting what God's been trying to do in your life, I'm here to tell you that God is speaking to you saying, allow me to write your story. Start submitting to what I have for you. We're going to look at one other situation, Daniel. Daniel, once again, was taken from his family. Taken by the king of another nation. They became prisoners of another nation. And he took all the smart kids, all the... All the guys and the girls who were the best of the best of the best. And he's like, I want them to come serve with me. And it says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But Daniel, and this is the part that I love about Daniel, determined that he would not defile himself. In other words, what this is telling me, he said, 
God, I'm not going to allow someone else to write my story. I'm going to allow you to write my story. This is what you said we need to do. This is how you said we need to live. This is what I'm doing. And I have determined. I have set my heart on it. I've set my mind on it. I've set my goals. I've set my will towards yours. And it goes on to say, by eating the king's food, and it goes on and on and on, and it talks about all this. Read this passage of scripture on your own time. Because these are some powerful stories. But it says this, after Daniel and his friends said, we will not do it your way, king. We're going to do it the way God says. He's writing our story, not you. In verse 17, it says this. God gave these four young men knowledge and skill in both books and life. In addition, Daniel was gifted in understanding and all sorts of visions and dreams. Listen, when we submit to God and we allow him to write our stories, our talents, our skills, our abilities are enhanced beyond our measure. Listen, God's not just writing your story. He's empowering you to make an impact in your position. He's taking you to bigger heights than you've ever dreamed. It may not be where you think you should be right now. But God's taking you there. Listen, I have no doubt that one day we will be paid staff at a church. No doubt. I have no doubt. Right now my heart is it will be here at this church. This is my church. We serve at this church because we believe in this church. We believe in the mission of this church. We believe we are called to Cornerstone Church of Tucson. Without a doubt. Yeah, we could have found other churches closer to our home. Yes, we could have done other things. But I remember Katie and I had a conversation about it. Right, there's no other place we want to raise our daughter than right here. Because we felt this is where we belong. That this church is part of our story. But I've got to challenge you guys today. Position yourself in Christ to grow. Listen, God's story, God cannot write your story unless you're willing to allow him to. If you're resisting God, Paul put it this way, why are you trying to kick against the goads? A goad was a big, sharp stick that shepherds would use to poke a sheep to get it to move. If God is trying to get you to move in a situation, or he's calling you out, or he's saying you're here for purpose, you're here for reason, why are you fighting against him? I believe I'm speaking to someone specifically today. I'm here to tell you to submit to what God is asking of you. There is purpose in the road you are walking on. Keep fighting for your dream. Stay faithful and you'll see it come to pass. There's someone in here that I believe, I don't know why last night in my prayer closet... God began to speak this to me. He said, Jeremy, there are people here today that they are fighting the situation that I have them in, but they are there for purpose. Choose to determine your attitude in that situation. Joseph had to determine that even though he was in a horrible situation, when he was in the prison, he still made the most of it. He still served like he was serving in the palace. He still worked for... The prison master, like he did for Potiphar, like he probably did for his dad. Choose your attitude. In other words, this is how I always heard it. Bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. Because I believe there are people in your life right now that God is saying, I have you there to make an impact in their life. So that when you leave, when I remove you, there will be a mark that I have left there through your life. When I promote you to the next position, they will look back going, that's what we need. That was the difference maker right there. So to position ourselves in Christ, I love this. I heard T.D. Jake say this, and I began to pray this over my life. He said, this has been always been his prayer. He said, his prayer has always been to, that God would make him better and more effective at what he set before him to do. Not to have success, not to have a mega church, but he said, God, just make me better and more effective at what you've set before me to do. God, in my current position, wherever you have me, please, Lord, make me better, make me more effective. Why? Because, God, I know there are people that right now that are in my life that you want me to have an impact on.
that how I live my life, the quality of my work, the quality of who I am is going to have an impact on them. And the whole time he's writing my story, he's longing to be writing their story. He's wanting them to know that there's a greater end to their story than what they see. And so we do what we need to do. We position ourselves in prayer. We position ourselves in the word. And we begin to seek after God. David put it this way. Psalm 84, 10 says, Lord, it's better as one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather have my position to be just a doorkeeper in your household than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. God, may our heart always be that, God, we want to be where you are. That I would rather be a lowly servant in your house than to have all the riches and wealth and all the position and power outside of it. God, if this is the situation you have us in, if you want Cornerstone Church of Tucson sitting in a theater for this moment, then this moment we're going to make the most of this situation. We're going to have the biggest impact we can have in this moment. Why? Because Cornerstone, there is coming a day we will be promoted out of this theater. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And what's happening is God is preparing us right here and right now for the next level of our church. But he's not just doing this as a church, he's doing this in your life. Because the only way a church gets promoted to the next level is when people on, as individuals get promoted to the next level. It doesn't happen just because we've got an amazing pastor and his family that give everything. It's going to happen because there's a congregation that gets behind him and says, we will give everything. We will make the most out of where we are. We're going to have the biggest impact we can have. Because there's a city out there city right outside these doors that need us to make an impact. That need us to go out and turn hearts to youth and families and to God and to each other. Because there are families that are being demolished as we speak right now. There are people who are suffering right now because of drugs, alcohol, depression. And the crazy thing is, is for most of us, they're just... <coughs> phone call away. You'll see them when you show up to work on Tuesday morning. Some of you will probably see them when you go home today. And God's like, I've got you here for purpose. I've got you here because there's someone who's been crying out. I've got you. I've empowered you. You're my child. I've got your back. And guys, get this. Get this. God wants to use you. God wants to use you right now. We just need to do what we read earlier. We just need to begin to speak. But listen, I know your life seems like it's crazy and upside down. I've been there. I know what it's like to walk a difficult road where you feel like everything's been stripped out of your life. But I can tell you because I allow God to write my story. Look at the riches I have now. I may not have financial riches, but I've got people around me who love me. i got a church that cheers me on. I've got a God that I can turn to in a moment. I can walk into a prayer closet and he wraps his arms around me. He tells me everything's going to be okay. That I know he always finishes what he starts. Worship team, if you can come. Today, as we finish up our... Serious. I've got to challenge you. Allow God to write the story of your life. Allow God to write your story. Because he's got so many great things for you. The pastor has preached it over us. Jeremiah 29, 11. He has plans for you. He has a future for you. He's got hope for you. He's got... A great story for you. But until you position yourself with Christ, He can't write your story. You have to say, God, I need you to write my story. Jesus, I need you in my life. I need to align myself with you. Come into my life. 
take my past, take my hurt, take my pain, and remove it. Or maybe today you're sitting there saying, God, I need you to write my story. If this is right now, it may not be the most ideal situation, and Lord, I know I can't wait to get out of it. But for now, let's make the most of it. Let's make the most of what you have for me right now. Make the most of what you have for us, for my family. Help us to have the biggest impact we can have right where we are. Break our hearts for the people that you placed in our life. Help us to see them as you see them so that I get the understanding of my position. That the people you've surrounded me with are not there by chance, but they're there.